A massive car bomb exploded outside of a large federal building in downtown Oklahoma City, shattering that building, killing children, killing federal employees, military men, and civilians. When we last left off, we learned that Ruby Ridge and the siege at Waco was Timothy McVeigh's reasons for staging an act of domestic terrorism. We learned his ties to white supremacist groups, as well as his stance on the government. Today, we're going to take a look at the bombing itself, starting with the target. The Alfred P. Murrah Building was built in 1977. It housed the Social Security Administration, Department of Veterans Affairs, the DEA, and the ATF. The building also housed a daycare center. The building itself was not in a major city. It was in Oklahoma City, so it wasn't built to withstand much. Hell, if an earthquake hit Oklahoma City, the building would be destroyed instantly because it wasn't built to earthquake codes. I make this point because it's actually discussed during the building and renovations that maybe they should just in case. Which was rejected because no one in the city government thought that an earthquake would happen in Oklahoma City, let alone a terrorist attack. Even though there was a plot in 1983 by the CSA, which is a Christian militant group with ties to the Christian identity movement. They wanted to park a van in front of the building and detonate rockets. But that plan was scrapped because one of the ordinances accidentally went off and those who plotted decided that it was divine intervention. Anyways, the building was named after a judge. McVeigh chose this building because of the windows. He expected the glass to shatter spectacularly. Also, its huge parking lot and open space around the building he felt was perfect for photos for propaganda purposes. Also thought the open space would contain the force of the blast to stop damage to non-government buildings. McVeigh had thought of two other plans before he decided on the bombing. The first was to murder both Janet Reno and Lon Hiroshi, the FBI sniper that killed Vicki Weaver. Lon Hiroshi was also at Waco. The second was to just bomb a federal building when no one was in it, which he decided against because Timothy McVeigh wanted to make a statement. McVeigh couldn't do this alone, so he got help from his buddy Terry Nichols. In 1994, the two would buy binary explosives from a gun collector named Roger E. Moore. On September 30th of 1994, Nichols bought 40 50-pound bags of ammonium nitrate, which at the time was a fertilizer, but could also be used to make a bomb. Then the two ended up robbing Moore, taking 60,000 worth of guns, silver, and jewels in a van. In October of 1994, McVeigh showed a diagram of the bomb to Michael and Lori Fortier. Altogether, the bomb he diagrammed was going to be 7,000 pounds. At one point, McVeigh went to the Alfra P. Murrah building, including inquiring about the daycare and asking about emergency exits. On April 14th, McVeigh checked into a room at a hotel in Junction City, Kansas. The hotel was called the Dreamland Hotel. The next day, he rented a 1993 Ford F700 from Ryder under the name Robert Klink, which another prep he did was to try to see if he could get the car with a fake bomb into the underground garage, but found he couldn't. It took him 15 minutes to try to do it. On April 16th, both McVeigh and Nichols drove to Oklahoma City where they parked a getaway car, a 1977 Mercury Marquis. They parked it several blocks from the Murrah building. He left a note on it, not abandoned, please do not tow, will move by April 23rd, within parentheses, needs battery and cable. From April 17th to April 19th, they began to build the bomb. He drew holes in the truck, two in the cab and two in the body, then ran two fuses through it to the bomb in the back. The fuses were connected to high-grade explosives that the pair stole from a rock quarry. The first was a 5-minute fuse, the second a 2-minute fuse. The fuses were hidden in a fish tank tubing and were painted yellow and duct taped to the inside of the cab to blend in. In case of failure, he placed two more explosives in the cargo bay near the driver's side, which he could set off with his Glock that he was carrying. After the bomb was made, Nichols and McVeigh parted ways. 
Nichols went home. McVeigh and the truck bomb they made traveled to Junction City to prepare for the next day, April 19th, 1995. Originally, McVeigh wanted to blow up the building at 11 a.m., but taking twisted inspiration from the Turner Diaries, he decided on 9 because in the book, the FBI headquarters that was bombed was done at 9.30. He even carried pages of the Turner Diaries in an envelope in his pocket with him. He also had on a shirt with the phrase, Sick Semper Tyrannis, which is what John Wilkes Booth yelled after shooting Lincoln. On the back of that shirt read, The Tree of Liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants which was said by Thomas Jefferson. He entered Oklahoma City at 8.50 a.m. At 8.57, he lit the first fuse. Three minutes later, while he was a block away from the building, he lit the other fuse. He pulled up to the building, parking the truck under the daycare center, then walked off. At 9.02, the bomb went off. 168 people were killed. Buildings were damaged in a four-block radius. The blast was heard and felt for up to 55 miles away. A 30-foot-wide crater was formed where the truck had been. The axle ended up blocks away, almost hitting traffic. A meeting happening in a different building happened to record the blast on audio. Uh, Receive information regarding... <laughs> Almost half of the building had collapsed in mere seconds. The power of the bomb cannot be overstated. It did what Timothy McVeigh wanted it to do. I'm going to say, before getting into the next section, in later interviews, McVeigh said he had no knowledge of the daycare center being there. If he had, well then, according to himself, he would have picked a different target. Too bad he was caught by witnesses and cameras scoping out the building, and even inquiring about the daycare center. With the hundreds of calls to 911, the time to search for who did it was a bit stalled. The bigger issue was rescuing those still alive and trapped. Six hundred and forty-six people were in the building that day. That includes children. 168 in total would be dead. But there was a severed leg that seemed to not match anyone else, so it could have been 169. One survivor, whose name escapes me, but I remember hearing the story from the episode done on this case on the last podcast on the left, was stuck in a parking lot. She found comfort in squeezing a severed hand while waiting to be rescued. Dana Bradley was there to get her three-month-old son a social security card. With her was her mother Cheryl, her three-year-old daughter Peach Lynn, as well as her three-month-old Gabrion. All three would be killed in the blast, but Dana survived. Pinned under rubble, rescue workers had to amputate her leg to get her free. They amputated her leg without anesthesia. Those are only just a handful of stories from that day. Rescue and recovery efforts lasted until May 5th, 1995 at 12.08 a.m. As stated, the Ryder truck was parked underneath the daycare center. This is the part of the bombing that received the most attention. Dana Bradley lost both her children that day, but there were babies and young children in the daycare center when the bomb went off. There is a famous picture of a firefighter holding the body of a child. The infant isn't dead, but was dying. To this, McVeigh would later say the deaths of the children were collateral damage, but PJ Allen wasn't one of those who died, and he was lucky to have made it. He was 18 months old when he survived the bombing. He suffered multiple injuries including burns, permanently damaged lungs, internal head injuries, and a broken arm. But he survived, as did six other children that were there that day. Six out of the 15 children in the daycare survived. I wish it was more, but life has a way of being overly hostile and unforgiving. There were three theories going around law enforcement agencies on who did this. The first is connected to the World Trade Center. In 1993, it was bombed, but the bomb only did structural damage to the building. It was done in a parking lot underneath the North Tower, and it was done by a man named Ramzi Youssef, a Pakistani man who had trained in an Al-Qaeda trading camp. Because the bombs were similar, a bomb made up of fertilizer, it is logical to go with that. 
There was also the drug cartels trying to cripple the DEA. And finally, the third theory, which happened to be the case, an anti-government nut job. McVeigh, when he got to his getaway car, had a hard time starting it at first and almost got away. But he forgot to put a license plate on the car. He got pulled over and the cop, noticing the gun, took him into custody. This happened 90 minutes after the bombing. While he was rotting in a jail cell, law enforcement were able to get a VIN number off the truck's axle. The same truck axle that landed blocks away. That VIN number led them to the place McVeigh rented the rider truck. A couple of sketches and description of the truck were plastered all over the news. A worker at the Dreamland Hotel remembered McVeigh and the truck and got in touch with law enforcement. Since he used his real name to register at the hotel and a fake name to rent the truck, they had two names. Meanwhile, a search of McVeigh by the police officer that arrested him found documents with a fake name and his real name. On April 21st, 1990, he almost got away. He was in a bond hearing when federal agents intercepted him and took him into custody. And this is where I will end this part. On the final part of this series, we will learn who Timothy McVeigh was, who Terry Nichols is, who both were friends with, the trials of everyone involved, the execution of Timothy McVeigh, and the possibility there is more to the story of the Oklahoma City bombing than was thought before. Did those who wanted swift action ignore key people who assisted Timothy McVeigh? Or was he a lone nut with accomplices who all served time for their part?